Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. For our viewers who were with us last week, you'll recall that we had a wonderful performance by uh, what was called Top Sergeant Wilkie uh, from the 1880s representing uh, the great history of the Buffalo Soldiers. We've invited our guest back, not in the character this time, but as himself, Albert Wilkerson. Uh, he lives in Idaho. We're very fortunate to have him in this beautiful state. And he shared a talk about peacekeepers of the Old West, the Buffalo Soldiers. Uh, he has a great background in history of this. And uh, as you saw last week, if, he, if you were with us, then he was role playing. Uh, Mr. Wilkerson, it's a pleasure to have you here. And we'll expand our discussion of. Uh, the entire history of uh, and moving to the 20th century too and what happened with the Buffalo Soldiers. Welcome back. Thank you. And I'm very pleased to have our regular panelist, Erna Reinhardt, who is the Director of Public Relations with our college and, and our guest panelist, my friend and colleague uh, in the History Department at North Idaho College, uh, Charlotte Chittick. And uh, thank you for putting us all together. You worked to put it together a program on campus today at North Idaho College. And, and we're so generous to ask Mr. Wilkerson to join us on this program. And with that, we'll ask Erna Reinhardt to start today's questioning. Albert, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Thank you. For the viewers that weren't with us last week and for those of us that don't know a whole lot about what a Buffalo Soldier was or who they were, share with us, um, with the viewers and with us, who they were, what they did, and when was it that they were um, part of our history. Well, the Buffalo Soldiers started out in 1866 and went right up through uh, the 20th century, first part of the 20th century. And basically, we were peacekeepers of the Old West. Uh, we maintained peace among the Native Americans, uh, among uh, white Americans, uh, everybody. Where there were not police uh, soldiers, uh, officers, uh, then we were used as, as police units, the 9th and the 10th. We were also used as border patrol. Uh, we patrolled the Mexican border, U.S.-Mexican border. Uh, we uh, chased the bandit Pancho Villa uh, several times across the border. Um, he was uh, pretty slick. Uh, <laughs> we also uh, chased Geronimo and Chief Victoria, and they were in and out of Mexico to take safe havens. And we did uh, things like providing service for the mail, escort service, because we were still using stagecoach and Pony Express, and we did a lot of that kind of protection. Uh, they were building telegraph lines then, and we did also that. And it's a interesting thing. We protected the stage, but we could not ride on the stage as a passenger. So that was uh, still pretty tough segregation and discrimination. Mm -hmm. And we did a various things, uh, even built roads, uh, and the 9th and the, and the 10th Cavalry. And I do believe because they were black troops, they were used where other whites, other troops, white troops were not used. And just a lot of dirty type details. Mm -hmm that we had to perform. And we did without, uh, we may have uh, grumbled among ourselves, but, but we did the work and we did it well and was proud. Um, there were two things about your unit that, that made you unique. I think one you mentioned you were an all black unit, but um, you also were a cavalry unit. So how did that make you different than the rest of the army or was the rest of the army also a cavalry unit? No, no. There's a foot soldier, which is the infantry, and then there's a cavalry mounted. And most of our adversaries, the Native American, they were also cavalrymen, and they rode uh, horseback. And we were like a rapid deployment uh, unit uh, with the horses, and you can get uh, places where other units, uh, like the, the 38th Infantry or the 24th or 25th, could not. It would take them a much longer time. We could cover a lot more ground. Uh, we traveled, we scouted for maybe 1,300 miles of 9th, 9th Cavalry, 
uh, looking for those various, uh, they call outlaw Indians or renegades. And you needed a horse to do this and to go in places that a horse, that a man could not uh, travel. So it was, uh, that's, that's a big difference uh, from the two units. And, and then the, their elite units, the cavalry. And because not only you, you have to know what a soldier's job is, you have to be a good horseman. And last question, just so we can lay the foundation for today's program. How, how big was the unit? Well, each, uh, the ninth had uh, about 10 troops and from A to whatever the alphabet goes up to an A, I was in, uh, in B troop, uh, or my, my character was in, in B troop <laughs> last week. <laughs> and, 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 and they would have about 120 uh, men and they would have platoons within in that troop and it would be the first platoon the second platoon and then you would have squads uh, in that and we had about a hundred oh let's see roughly there was about 30 30,000 uh, cavalrymen in in the two regiments and the ninth and tenth uh, o- over the period of uh, 20 to 30 years Charlotte? You say we because you also kind of relate to, don't you? Yes. Um, you're a veteran. Yes. And um, so I kind of have a two part question. Um, oh, first of all, say, yeah. He was a Marine. You know, Marines are very proud of that. Yes. You're well, a Marine. I, I don't want to correct you there. <laughs> <laughs> Good. We have to get that straight. Yes. Um, there is the, the Buffalo Soldier. Last week, um, you talked a little bit about how the name Buffalo Soldier comes to be. Yes. And I was wondering if you could kind of reiterate that history where, why Buffalo Soldier? But also, is that a term that dies out, that isn't used anymore? Is there a new term that comes to be used? Because there's still going to be segregation in the military all the way up in the middle of the 20th century. So do you find, you know, that sometimes it is used, the idea of the Buffalo Soldier can be someone in a black regiment in the Second World War, that type of thing? Well, we like to, you know, veterans of the day, like to think of us all as being a Buffalo Soldier because that's where it began. Mm-hmm. Whether you're in the Marines, the Navy, the Air Force, but uh, especially the Army, and it's a recognized uh, name and it's an official name now, the Buffalo Soldiers. And the Buffalo Soldiers' name came about uh, from some say the Cheyenne Indians, some say the uh, Arapahoes, some say. Uh, uh, not not Comanches, but most of the Plain Indians, mm-hmm. and and I uh, I think the Sioux was was one uh, that they gave us the name Buffalo Soldiers. The Buffalo in the Native American life is the most uh, important animal and mm-hmm. source of everything: food, clothing, shelter, weapons, and they revere that animal. And when they first, as the story is told, when they first saw black troops riding horses. Some people say that it was during the winter months going through Montana and they had buffalo robes and they would be humped over their their horses and it looked like a, a buffalo in a hump and then when they saw the face and they were dark and of course the hair uh, was soft and curly, woolly like mm-hmm. and they said the buffalo soldier. And then there's others say that because they revered this animal so highly that they thought the buffalo, the, the black troopers, were just as important as the buffalo, and they named them Buffalo Soldier. And it, it wasn't official yet, and it was sort of like a nickname. And then, but it, as time went on, years passed by, it became more popular, and the Buffalo Soldiers found something that they could identify. It was, it was separated, separated them from the rest. Mm-hmm. Uh, not only color, but because of the badge of honor that they, they had something to be proud of. And it's a today, respectful name, oh, rather oh. than so many of the names in history. Oh, oh, that. yes, yes, a very respectful name. And today, uh, Buffalo, it is an official uh, unit in the Army. Now, they don't have Buffalo soldiers per se a unit. They don't have segregated units anymore, right. but it is an official uh, and then there's a monument that's dedicated in 1992 by then General Colin Powell in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Wonderful. Yes, so that uh, that kind of put us on on the map, and and we're we're glad for that. Not yeah. just for the for the blacks, but for the country. It is part of U.S. 
history, and uh, I think it should be all told. That uh, makes me think of, okay, so I'm at the gym and I'm on the elliptical reading People magazine, and I come across the celebration of Black History Month, and they've chosen to interview um, Herb Jeffries. Oh, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. so he tells this story about how He's playing in Cleveland, takes a break, goes out into the alley, and uh, there's some white kids running down the alley. And behind him, a little black boy, and he says, were they being mean to you? And the little black kid says, no. He says, I wanted to play, they're playing cowboys, and I want to play cowboys, but they say there ain't no such thing as a black cowboy. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it goes on, you know, to interview him, and it's a, a great interview, but it, it makes me think so much of how there is this huge part of history that people just don't know. And of course, and it's, it's been perpetuated by the media and the way that history books mm -hmm. are portrayed and so forth. So having said that, my, my question to you is, do you see some progress in this area? I mean, you're going out and you're talking to people about this. Um, do you see more of an awareness? Do you see some change taking place? Well, I have to say yes. Not as much as I believe that should be and could be. And of course, Hollywood has, has helped that a little. Right. And you will see uh, actors, well-known actors, who just lost one, Ozzie Davis, he's played in Western movies. Uh, back to Herb Jeffries, he was a singing cowboy. Mm -hmm. And at the time he was in that club in Cleveland, uh, he was not making a movie. And when he, he made four movies. And he would go into the clubs and, and entertain. So that's, that's how he got there and those little kids. And he was the, the first black cowboy, singing cowboy, and he was a good looking cowboy. He was tall mm -hmm. and he could ride a horse and he was a Harlem buckaroo. And uh, I know him personally and uh, have pictures with him and he still sings. So uh, we have done, made some progress. Yeah. Seemed like that experience was inspirational to him, kind of saying, "Hey, we've got to get out there. People need to know that." Yes, and he's still cowboys. doing this. Isn't that great? Yes, and yeah. I also uh, do as much as I can. Uh, I also talk on on the Black West and uh, educate, try to educate as many as I can. Um, I tell you a real quick story, if I may. Uh, when I was in the Marines in 1957, a station at 29 Palms, California, was a Marine base there. And in those days, on the desert, there isn't much to do. And if you didn't have a car, there was anything to do. But on the base, they had horse stable, had 10 horses. And I went up to ride a horse. And a sergeant, I won't call his name, but he denied me the chance to ride a horse. And he told me, colored people don't ride horses. Mm. And I was really, really, really hurt because I rode a horse when I was four years old. Standing, yeah. standing on his back, and yeah, my mother thought she was going to have a heart attack. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's a huge part of your life now. Well, Horses yes, are everything. Yes, yes, has been as uh, I guess from age 15 to now. So it's uh, about 50 years. Horses have been a part of my life. Yeah. We've had so many examples on this program, and last week too, of uh, the awful harm of discrimination and how hurtful it is, and how irrational and unfair it is. I do want to add a footnote before my question. This program's been going for 33 years, and we've had some remarkable people like yourself over the years. And, and when you mentioned that this year there was the death of Ozzie Davis, mm -hmm. he and Ruby Dee, his spouse, uh, shortly before his death, won the Kennedy Center Awards, and I was privileged to observe uh, that award taking place. But the connection with this program is that Ozzie Davis and Ruby Dee came here for a great conference uh, that we put on, and we're on this program together. Uh -huh. yeah. and it was one of the highlights of uh, our years on this program, and I recall this, they'd come from Detroit in a meeting there, and, and on Sunday morning when they were leaving for the airport, they both gave me a large hug and said, things have been very difficult just before that, and, and their spirits have been lifted here. So we have this very special story about those remarkable two people. Uh, Mr. Wilkerson, uh, you're a, certainly a very fine student of, of this whole process, and in the program last week, you were talking about that the Buffalo Soldiers, the African American soldiers, uh, and with their many talents and their languages and all, were often used by our government to go and actually uh, fight against the Native Americans. And both the Native Americans and the African Americans have suffered in the past so much uh, 
harm and discrimination and still there are challenges and problems. Mm -hmm. uh, as you look back on that time from your historical perspective, uh, would you not say <coughs> that that was very difficult and very, uh, a very troublesome time to take one minority group that has faced such discrimination and pit them against another mm -hmm. uh, minority group? Uh, from an emotional, psychological viewpoint, <coughs> that must be very difficult. It was extremely difficult, and it would be as as difficult as if I was in the Marines now and had to go to Africa and uh, and fight or to kill uh, the the black Africans. And back in in the 1880s, and I'm sure those soldiers felt the same way. At least some uh, of them. Hollywood does a good. Uh, job of uh, painting a different picture and they made the, the, the movie Buffalo Soldier with Danny Glover mm -hmm. and I know Danny uh, personally but I, I didn't didn't like that that movie because uh, the movie predicted him and the Buffalo Soldier as as the whites did uh, the Indians and and that's that's a shame uh, we were taking property taking land uh, destroying nations and people and, and families and I'm sure the Buffalo soldiers felt the same because their families had been destroyed and, uh, and killed and many of their uh, kinship had lost lives coming across in the Middle Passage. So uh, yes, those were really, really tough times, but they had a job to do and they were very loyal uh, to this government and they got little thanks for it and, and that's hard. And, it, um, it continued that way up until when I was in the military myself. And uh, I had, the, the Marine Corps had only been integrated a few years before I joined in 1955. And, and the president had to give an executive order to, uh, for the service to fully integrate. That was my lead up question and that is President uh, Harry Truman uh, issued an executive order as Commander in Chief and, and, and Chief Administrator uh, integrating the military. And yes. then uh, to complete the process, General Eisenhower was present and also did that. So I'd like to get your response to uh, the, how important that was and the courage of uh, Harry Truman to do that. Harry Truman was the kind of president that he didn't check opinion polls before he did things. Yeah. So, uh, would you like to, to give him some honor of what uh, he did? In other words, sometimes we do things by a statute of Congress, sometimes we do it by the U.S. Supreme Court, but also there's been progress by executive orders, and this is a really good example of that. Yes, well, he did the right thing, and it, it, was, it was something that had to be done. And I'm sure that uh, he knew the history well and, and how the, the black man had served his country uh, over and over again had proven himself and it was good for the country it was good for the service and like was mentioned before there was a lot of talents going a waste there and uh, and Mr. Truman he did an outstanding uh, thing there was a lot of resistance uh, the Marine Corps was the last one to integrate and they fought it and I remember there were a lot of southerners in the Marine Corps and we had a special boot camp that was called Moffett Point uh, in South Carolina where they trained black troops. And that was all done away when, when Truman gave that order in 1948, I believe it was. And uh, it took a, a lot, but it took a lot on, on the, both parts of, of the black troops themselves. We had to help ourselves. We, we had to reinvent the wheel and show them that we were worthy. We spilled our blood in, um, um, in the Second World War in Japan. Uh, I know uh, Marines that are still alive that fought in that war, and they're called Moffat Pointers. So uh, Mr. Truman, uh, he was bold. Uh, he spoke loudly, and uh, he, it took an executive order. He had a change of heart, I would imagine, because it was wrong. Share with us, Albert, what inspired you to become involved with telling this story and sharing it with both youngsters and adults? First of all, uh, it was the Black West. When I started working with the Black West, 
and I had to find out from where did the black cowboy or the black west, what did they have to do with, with the Buffalo Soldier? And the Buffalo Soldier led me uh, to the black west. You know, where did these cowboys, I knew they were black cowboys, and I knew I had some black cowboy blood in me from a, from a little uh, kid, you know, because horses just drawn the horses like uh, bees to honey. And I, uh, I started researching the black cowboy and I found out there were black soldiers that rode horses. And I was shocked, I was surprised. And uh, in the movies you see John Wayne and other actors uh, portraying, uh, you know, cowboys, and, and and I'm going, hey, something has to be different here, and and, and my father rode horses, uh, being part Indian and swimming, and that's another thing, swimming. We can talk another uh, another <laughs> show on, on swimming. Blacks don't swim, right. but <laughs> I started researching, and I heard about Herb Jeffrey. And I was surprised. And he wore a white hat. You know, it wasn't a black hat. And he could sing. And he rode a white horse. And I'm going, hey, that must be many others. And yes. And I heard about Bill Pickett uh, that rode for the uh, 101 Ranch. Uh, he was the first bull. And in fact, he created the sport of bulldogging. And he rode a horse. And I'm going, my gosh. Someone has been lying to us, and especially when this sergeant told me that color folks don't ride horses, because when I was 15 years old, I rode in the Michigan State Fair Parade with the Cisco Kid and Poncho. I was 15. Out wow. of all the kids, I was chosen to ride mm -hmm. with them. So I knew that there had to be some black cowboys someplace. And I found Matt Love, Deadwood Dick, and all those guys. <laughs> Ms. Brooks keeps connecting with all these people in history. It's really fascinating. Yeah, it's amazing. Charla. I, your heart lies in a lot of places right now. Um, living here in Idaho, where, where does your heart lie? What kind of things are you looking forward to doing in this area? Working with kids. I like to expose kids as much as I can uh, with uh, horses, with history, and being a good human being and uh, teaching uh, them. Because I think we owe, adults owe a lot to children. Mm -hmm. And uh, the people in Idaho, northern Idaho, are great. Uh, that's why we just took up roots and, and moved here. <laughs> My wife thought I was crazy, but then everybody else in California thought we were crazy, but I said there's something there, and I've had nothing but uh, good times and wonderful people, such as at this table. Charlie should make a point that his lovely wife is on the faculty yes, in our division. Yes, and, uh, in, our, in our division, <laughs> yes. too. Which is the social behavioral sciences, and so she's another good addition to Idaho. Um, Erna didn't do this question, so but I learned it from her, so I'll give her credit. <laughs> uh, there is the uh, uh, Buffalo Soldiers Museum, isn't there, Erna? And at least in Houston, Texas. Uh, have you been and visited that? Are you I, that? I have not. I've been too busy doing other things. Uh, we have a, an association. There's a 9th and 10th Calvary uh, Association, and they go all around, and there's chapters all over the country and they go to the museums, and they, the biggest one, the best one, is Fort Leavenworth, and that's where, where the statue uh, is. And we just had a Buffalo soldier to die in Tacoma uh, last week. Um, but I should I, add that we're taping this program in February. It will air later, but that's when that happened. That oh, death, yes. Yeah. Yes. Arna Reinhardt. Tell us, I, I love this question and I use it as often as I can, but is there any special memory that you have of, of a child after they saw your performance that maybe their eyes lit up and, and, and you had an effect on them? Oh, all the time. Is there a favorite one? Uh, no, they're all favorite. Uh, they, they, <laughs> which child? Which is child's favorite? Yeah. Right. And no, 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 really, they, they're all f uh, um, favorite ones and I don't, uh, because... Children are so innocent, 
and if they, they they can feel if you were a good person, I believe you, they can feel, mm -hmm. and I try to come over that way, and uh, and I I feel I connect uh, with children. I enjoy teaching uh, when I taught in San Diego City Schools, and uh, the kids they ask so many questions about because this is all new to them too, and mm -hmm. I don't mean the black and white thing, just being a Buffalo soldier and having someone to come in and dress in a uniform such as myself and with the boots and the spurs and even though I don't promote weapons but they want to see the weapons that was part of it and that's okay so there are no favorites uh, there is one and as it popped into my mind's eye a little girl uh, third grade when I told her we rode a horse for 18 20 hours she said well how do you go to the bathroom <laughs> 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 See, that's what they think of. That's, well, that's a great. logical question. Yeah, yes. that's perfect. Yeah. That's great. How do you go to the bathroom? And I don't remember how I answered it, but we we, we got the answer. You know, right. there's, a, there's a lot of bushes out there. You know, and oh, that's great. Because we slept in the saddle too. You know, uh, right? Yeah, and you had to keep moving, and you didn't drink a lot of water. And I think that was one of the answers. You know, because your canteen mm. only held so much about a quart of water. Right. So you didn't drink a lot of water. You didn't eat a lot of that jerky, which had a lot of salt in it. Yeah. I think there's also a website, and I believe our staff took it, and I'll ask them to put the website up. If they did, put it down. I think they did. Uh, so people that can pursue this further, we always like to educate our people. Yes, the website just went up on the screen. So for those who want to do more research and what you've been dealing with over the two weeks, they can certainly do it at this site. That's part of our contribution to education is encourage people when they are uh, introduced to such topics that they can pursue it. I, I know that on our lecture series here at the North Carolina College Popcorn Forum, a number of the students get so excited about someone in history and they go do papers on it and, mm -hmm. and it ex escalates yeah. the learning process and our knowledge comes over time, I think, wisdom and so uh, one of the most um, effective things that one can do is to think and it's, it's encouraged uh, certainly to engage in critical and analytical thinking. You certainly have done that here today. I want to say on behalf of the panel and the staff, uh, what a pleasure to have you here this two weeks. You are a remarkable person and you have excited us to pursue more information and uh, thanks for the contribution you've given to this program and to our institution. Well, thank you for the pleasure. I mean, the opportunity is a pleasure to be here uh, both times you. and uh, anytime I can help, uh, just okay, give me a call. You. Ladies and gentlemen, with us again next week at the same time, we'll discuss another issue. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest running in house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station.